Welcome back to Becoming Bohemian, um, to our November month club. Can you believe it? We're rounding the corner on 2017. We're past that corner, actually. We're almost to the end of the year, which is so hard to believe. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving week last week, um, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed Emile Zola's The Belly of Paris. November is such a wonderful month, isn't it? Um, it is a month that's known both for politics and for food, um, at least here in the United States. And I think uh, polarity and strong feelings are associated with this month. Um, and I think it can be sorely tempting to focus on, um, on what divides us and our differences more than what unites us and, uh, and makes us grateful, <laughs> maybe unfortunately. Um, and I think while your sense of civic duty and love for football and for family and roasted turkey and homemade pecan pie, um, might seem all American. Uh, our book club book from this month makes it very clear that America is still in its infancy when it comes to both our democratic republic um, and our culinary culture too. Um, we have borrowed a lot from many different countries, um, not least of all which is France. And, uh, and I really feel like I have to um, give some thanks uh, to our allies across the pond who have given us the Statue of Liberty and Le Cordon Bleu, right? The, the culinary art institution um, that's very famous there in Paris and here as well. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, um, merci mille fois, Emile Zola, um, for blessing us with this seminal work, our book this month, The Belly of Paris. Um, I am just, oh, I'm so excited to get into this. And this month is a little bit different. I know the last few months we have had um, either audio or visual or both participation by an expert. This month, Danielle Defidi, a friend of mine who has worked for Michelin ranked uh, two star uh, restaurant chef, master chef Dominique Crenn, uh, who owns Atelier Crenn here in San Francisco as well as Petit Crenn. Uh, she was kind enough to answer some questions that I raised on behalf of the book club, um, but she had to do those written. Um, unfortunately, she had to write her responses simply because she has been so busy. It is a month of food and she has been very busy cooking um, in, in the restaurant she works at. And so she literally had a 2 a.m. slot that she had available to answer the questions. So I um, I wish that she could be here physically with us, uh, but I will be giving voice to her words um, by sharing her responses about food in this particular book club meeting. And that is um, we're going to be the primary focus, I think, of this book club. You know, politics is a tricky thing to get into. Food is just a little bit safer, I think, especially in these times. And so um, I think it's, it's important to note that Emile Zola was masterful at this. Uh, he was writing during a time of revolution in France, and you get that feel through Florent, for the, through the protagonist of, uh, you know, the main character of his work, um, you, you know, it, it opens and Florent is a recently escaped from um, Cayenne and, uh, and the, the political prisons over there in those penal colonies um, in South America and has made it back to Paris, his hometown, and, uh, and makes it into the markets. Um, and I think, I think the food aspect, because Emile Zola couches all of the, the, the politics in delicious descriptions of the food of the day, of the marketplaces and their importance in French society, I think it makes the, the his political leanings, um, and he was very much a progressive of his time as far as politics goes, but it makes it more palatable because um, 
as the the translator um, that I, I read the translation by uh, Mark Kurlansky and his introduction was really um, wonderful uh, he you know he says about Zola he says Zola a highly political man always insisted on the separation of um, art and politics though he very much wanted to be known for his political stances he did not want his novels to be thought of as political pieces um, and in 1876 when Le Sommoir sometimes titled in English The Dram Shop was first serialized critics infuriated Zola by calling him a socialist writer um, for his dark depiction of working class life, he responded, I do not accept the label you paste on my back. I mean to be a novelist, pure, purely and simply without any qualifying adjective. If you insist on qualifying me, say that I am a naturalistic novelist. That will not annoy me. Um, of course, his concern for the plight of the poor did not necessarily make him a socialist. He read Charles Fourier, Pierre Proudhon, and Karl Marx, and he appreciated their arguments, especially those of Marx, which were presented in this structure of science because Zola worshipped science. He was a scientist. And I think you get that um, through these very artistic descriptions, but very sort of scientific and almost clinical at times descriptions, not only of the killing of the pigeons, which is um, painted in a very sort of morbid, tragic scene, but also very sort of uh, clinical scene, um, but also just simply in, in, in the way that he talks about the way cabbages are cut, the way that meat is cut, um, black pudding, blood pudding, and sausages are prepared. It's very sort of scientific and very detailed. He's a very detailed writer. Um, he, Mark uh, goes on to say it was his contention that it was the duty of writers to expose the weaknesses in a society and the duty of the politicians to act upon them. Uh, he assumed both roles, but never mixed them. He believed a novel should bear the mark of an individual and not an ideology. There are no tirades or polemics in Zola novels. Those he reserved for well-crafted newspaper articles, such as the famous J'accuse, in which he attacked the government for its persecution of Dreyfus. And Dreyfus was a, a revolutionary figure um, who was also a political prisoner. And you see, I think he draws on his uh, experience with Dreyfus, um, you know, and uses it in his character, Florent. Um, I said I was not going to dwell too much on politics. I will simply state that for me, it was fascinating reading this, given the times that we are in. Um, it feels very much like a time of upheaval in politics and some might even say revolution um, in politics and it is interesting to watch as history so often repeats itself and that's all I think that I will say. <laughs> I'll let you all draw your own conclusions from the political side of this book. Um, and without further ado, let's jump into the food and let's start um, the discussion, the monologue discussion, but I hope it will feel a little bit like a dialogue with food specialist, um, culinary artist, and our month's expert, Danielle Defidi, um, who is very much a lover um, of all things related to food and the artistic preparation of food. Um, I encourage everyone to check out Dominique Crenn. Um, you can see her, there's an episode devoted to her in the Netflix series, Chef's Table. Um, in fact, Danielle was present at Petit Crenn when that was being filmed, which is kind of an interesting little thing to note. Um, and, uh, and it's fascinating to see the artistry and the naturalism in um, Dominique Crenn's work. I think that Emile Zola would have been in love with um, the scientific natural world that Dominique Crenn, the culinary artist and chef extraordinaire, puts into her artistry, her work of um, the culinary arts. And Danielle um, is such a wonderful knowledge source and I just have to give a shout out to her on film. Thank you, Danielle, for the time you put into answering these questions that I asked about 
uh, the food world. Um, so without further ado, the first question that I asked Danielle was regarding food supply chain. Um, so the book, The Belly of Paris, uh, spends most of its time in Les Alles markets in Paris known as the Belly of Paris. And um, as it was where everyone went to get food and it was how restaurants sourced their produce. Um, and I personally felt um, like, or I feel personally like, um, I guess, you know, we live, I live with my, my husband in a high rise in the San Francisco area. Um, it's an urban part of the city and we have lovely farmers markets in the ferry building which is a walking walking distance a um, little bit on the expensive side I will say definitely a little bit more pricey um, than some of the produce that uh, that was that I'm sure was sold in the time of um, Florence time in this in this novel um, and then there's also Alamany market which is a short drive away as well but I do feel you know there there's not I mean you have to drive a distance, not too far, but a, a fair distance to really get to the rural side of North, Carol uh, North California, Northern California. Um, and so I do feel like, you know, often we go to supermarkets and we we can sometimes be kind of removed from our food. You know, we'll go to a restaurant, we'll go to a supermarket, but we don't necessarily really think through the source of the food so much. Um, and, uh, but Danielle does say, you know, to be honest, I would have to disagree. San Francisco is surrounded by a lot of amazing rural farming areas. And since moving here from the East Coast, where she's from, I have had some of the best produce I've ever tasted from farmer's markets right here in the city. Uh, so that, you know, that was a, a nice little shout out for, uh, for my neighborhood in San Francisco. Um, and then I did ask her, how is food sourced for a restaurant like Petit Crenne? And she said restaurants in the city source their food directly from different farmers in the surrounding area. So they are right to the farm. Uh, we are able to order from them in advance and pick up the orders at the farmer's markets while checking out other produce that is available. We also work with different purveyors such as 2xC in, in San Francisco that works with local fishermen as well as fish companies around the world to bring fresh seafood to restaurants. Working with um, this company, I've gotten in fish that was caught off the coast of Baja only six hours before it hit my cutting board. How cool is that? And that's pretty much as close, you know, as you get to, to your food and to fresh, I think, um, as anything. There are also large vendors similar uh, to Cisco that supply a lot of basic kitchen essentials such as celery, onions, lemons, anything that can be bought in bulk, uh, they can buy through Cisco and these big distribution companies that help restaurants out. Uh, and then I asked who on staff selects the produce, like who in the restaurant is the one that really calls the shots when it comes to what food is, is picked out uh, to be served at the restaurant. And she said ordering is typically, typically done by the head chef or the stew chef, so the chef just underneath that master chef of the restaurant. So I asked, do restaurants have a proprietary relationship with particular farms and vendors? Do they sort of have ownership? Meaning if you work for Petit Cren, you are the only one who can source from a particular venue, ven, vendor, right? And, and you, uh, you, know, you try to kind of box out anyone else because it becomes kind of a part of your brand and who you are. And you want to kind of have that corner on the marketplace there. And she said, it really depends. There are vendors who work with most restaurants in the city, and there are specialty vendors who will only work with chefs that they have a relationship with. Either way, it is important to most chefs that they create a close relationship with their farmers and vendors. That way they know they will be able to rely on them or even call them with a last minute request in an emergency scenario. Specialty vendors uh, who sell things such as caviar and truffles or other mushrooms work much differently than the average vendor. A lot of times these vendors choose who they want to sell products to. A fun example she gives is a woman named Connie who she works with and Connie forages for mushrooms in Northern California. She decides who she will sell her mushrooms to at a very, very steep price. And San Francisco is already um, the price of produce is very different than you might find in other areas, um, like the area I'm actually currently in right now in Oklahoma, um, you know, which is a little closer maybe to farms and just things are priced um, a little bit lower. 
And so to imagine, you know, Connie, who is this expert in mushrooms and truffles, uh, she, because she is known as one of the experts in these very specialty uh, resources, restaurant resources of these truffle mushrooms, she has her sort of pick of the restaurant litter and um, can be very selective um, and, and is able to sell them at a very steep price because they are so prized. Um, and so she only works with chefs she has built a relationship with. So um, I can imagine the courtship, the court, uh, you know, the courtship of these specialty vendors must be kind of interesting. Trying to find your truffle man or woman, you know, your go-to person uh, for these wonderful foods and flavorful, you know, um, flavor profiles to add to your dishes. Uh, so the next kind of series of questions, the next next uh, topic that I asked her was about prep. Um, and Emil Zola, you know, he describes beautifully the prep work that goes into making everything. We talked a little bit about this earlier, from cheese to black pudding and even pigeons. Um, so I asked her how much time is spent prepping at a restaurant. She said a lot of time. Uh, there are prep cooks at all restaurants who work eight to 10 hour shifts, doing things like shucking peas, making pastas and stocks and butchering meat. Most of what restaurant work is, is prep. Like that is the majority. It's kind of that, you know, out of that 80, 20 rule, you know, 80% is prep work. And uh, she says the cooking that guests see when they're at the restaurant is, Honestly, it's really just that finishing, kind of the cherry on top. That's the finishing uh, part. It's the putting together of a dish. Uh, for example, she gives this example. Right now, we have a dish that is a seafood stew. And the prep for this dish alone is, in no particular order, break down whole black cod into fillets and portion into four ounce pieces. Make a fish stock. So stock of, you know, is a broth or a soup. Uh, clean manila clams, cook flagole beans, make a house-made tomato paste, make a saffron and fennel sofrito, fennel sofrito, excuse me, cook and pick crab, make a roil sauce, juice the lemons. All of these things need to be done before the guests even arrive. Um, and that way, when the guest orders that particular menu item, she says, I can steam the clams, sear the black cod, mix the beans, stock, the stock, the tomato paste, and sofrito together and season with fish sauce and lemon juice and heat it all up and mix the crab with the royal and serve it. So that, I mean, that's a lot of work. That is one menu item. One menu item. That's a stew too. That's one menu and, and just so involved, right? Um, and so I just think, oh my goodness. I mean, that is, you know, it's huge and, and you just you and you have no real sense for that amount of work as a patron at a restaurant I feel um, I have just such an in speaking with Danielle um, such a renewed interest fascination and respect for the food industry and frankly in reading this book um, Emile Zola's book I have such a respect for the um, just all of the preparation that goes to bringing produce to market and then taking that produce from the market and creating something truly beautiful and magnificent from a visual perspective, from a, a whole sensory experience, right? The smell, the taste, the look, the way it's plated, it really is true all-encompassing art. So I ask her um, regarding that prep, you know, is it something that is ongoing throughout the day? excuse me, uh, or are there particular times dedicated, you know, specifically to prep work? And she said prep is ongoing for some cooks. Um, like I mentioned before, she said preps, bef prep cooks spend their entire shift doing prep, that eight to 10 hours, just solely focused on prepping for the dishes on the menu. Um, and then they have what they refer to as service. Um, which is when they are on the line cooking food for guests. And some of you might be familiar if you watch cooking shows like Hell's Kitchen with um, celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay and others where, you know, or Chef's Table, the Netflix series, where you'll see um, the line cooks preparing the meals for the guests in the kitchen. And the chef kind of, and sous chef, um, 
managing that ordering you know the, the line cooks um you know sharing the tickets with the line cooks to you know to help them know how many of a particular dish has been ordered and and what they need to do to prep that dish um so then i i asked uh what is prep like for a menu served at petit crane because as i mentioned before danielle worked for dominique crane at her restaurant petit crane and Danielle says, prep ranges from things like peeling and cleaning vegetables to making stocks and sauces, scrubbing oysters, breaking down a whole fish, and then portioning it. The word prep really describes doing everything you need for a dish except putting it on the plate. So that's a lot. That's <laughs> a lot. Um, and and so then, you know, I think I think it's it's really beautiful as you look at some of the prep work in Emile Zola's book, right? He, um, you know, from talking about uh, how the beautiful Lisa works and um, and just all of the all of the intricacies that go into bringing good food to market, you know, and the the mountains of cabbages and cheeses and just um all of the fish um and and catching the fish sourcing the fish and then bringing it to market um it's just his descriptions are so beautiful um he he says here where he's talking about just the fish um, I'll just pick this one little section. Jumbled together by the chance scoop of a fishing net in the mysterious depths of the great sea had given up everything. Codfish, haddock, flounder, plais, dabs, common fish, murky gray with white splotches, eels, thick murky blue snakes with black slits for eyes, so slimy they seemed to still be alive and slithering. The wide flat skates had a pale underbelly edged with soft red and an upper side marbled along a bumpy back down to the ribbing of the fins, a canabar red stripe with Florentine bronze and the somber palette of toads and poisonous flowers. There were round-headed, horrible dogfish with their mouths gaping like Chinese gargoyles and short fins, the shape of bat wings, fitting monsters to stand guard over treasures in, an, in ocean grottoes. You know, I, and that kind of touches back on his scientific side, but I just, as I was, you know, interviewing Danielle and then reading the book, there's so much more to fish you know, than I realized. There's so much more to a fish stew. There's so much more to this preparation of, you know, Danielle mentions um, completely, you know, boning and, and, and prepping this, this fish, um, you know, that, that, that goes into prep work, you know, and cook and, and cleaning mussels and clams, steaming them, like all of these things that um, go into making something as simple as fish stock and other things that, um, there's just, I mean, you pick, you know, there's so many different food items to work with, um, from so many different food groups and just fish alone or creating a fish dish. It's, um, it's a little overwhelming for someone completely untrained in the culinary arts, you know, to, to just see how much more there is than the consumer realizes and how much more really goes into it than you would ever think. Um, would go into just that that 12 inch plate dinner plate or whatever that is is placed before you um, I uh, I then asked um, a little bit more around food politics so we, we're not going to talk too much more about the politics in in the book um, the belly of Paris but uh, I, I will talk a little bit about the food politics. You know, we you have these interesting rivalries between Lisa and the beautiful Normand and, you know, all of the different market stalls that are competing a little with each other and there are these kind of alliances made and sort of love-hate relationships and love triangles that come out of this book all surrounded by food. And, um, and I think, Many of you might might know um, about 
just remember just a few years ago there was a lot of news around the horrible chef suicides that uh, they've made headlines um, recently when the Michelin ranking of restaurants was questioned and um, and so there's just so much pressure in in the restaurant business um, it you know we just discussed prep there's so much work that goes in. Uh, it's hard to keep a restaurant solvent. It actually it can be really hard when you think about the amount of effort and the food sourcing and preparing and cooking. And then, you know, it's just, it can be very difficult and a highly competitive space to be working in. So I, I asked Danielle kind of what role that that she saw that that played in the restaurant business and, and what it's really like to, uh, to work in just such a competitive environment. And she said, working in the industry is tough. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, she said, that means that you have to be tough tough. You have to be strong, whether that means having thick skin and being able to take the criticism and backlash from the people uh, above you or being physically tough, a physically tough person who can withstand working 13 hour shifts, five and sometimes six days a week and doing physical lab labor as well as standing for all 13 of those hours. That is a demanding job. Um, you know, I thought my work and my life was demanding and stressful. But as I was chatting with Danielle, I just thought, my goodness, like that is serious work. And that is, I mean, it is physical work. It's mental work. It's creative work. It, every kind of genre of work actually goes into food. It's fascinating that such a simple, fundamental part of being human, that need that we have as human beings to feed, to eat, um, that very basic human survival um, mechanism that we have of, of, of finding food and eating food, it is demanding and it is time consuming and, um, it, there's just so much that that goes into it. Um, I uh, I then talked about the creative side with her um, because you know as we've read in the book, um, Emil Zola he he is an artist, a literary artist, but you really come to see his appreciation for the artistry that goes into food. Um, I, I find it fascinating that he, for at least a year, uh, Mark Kurlansky talked about how he spent a lot of time um, actually living as Florent did, practically living kind of um, as, uh, you know, homeless um, effectively initially you know as, as Florent is initially just outside of the markets just spending days and days at the markets and right there in that area soaking up that that life of um, a tradesman or of you know the um, the farmers and uh, and the butchers that that work that their livelihood and their day-to-day -day was there at the markets and he he made sure that he wanted his writing he was very journalistic in his way of writing um, while it's a novel he was such a researcher um, and I I have a little bit of that I guess that envy part of me <laughs> part of me thinks how fascinating would that be I, I love the idea of getting to spend time uh, in in a profession like that are, are just investigating and researching these things. Um, but he got so caught up in it and you just see that so often through his writings. Um, and, uh, and he, and his love of art and you, and you see him kind of juxtaposing or not necessarily juxtaposing, but highlighting the artistry of the food with the visual arts. And that's what I think is so interesting where he has um, his, his artist friend, Claude, um, who, who comments a lot of, uh, on art. And, um, 
and also how art and food and the presentation of food go hand in hand. Claude says it's fine for those who want to encase art in a toy box. Um, it's a big thing now to say that art cannot live with science. The products of industry kill poetry. Then all those fools start crying in their flowers as though anyone were trying to harm them. It nauseates me. I would love to answer these those idiots with art that was truly outrageous. It would feel good to upset them. You know what my best work has been so far? The one that gives me the greatest satisfaction when I look back? This is a great story. Last year on Christmas Eve, I was staying with my Aunt Lisa and that moronic apprentice, you know him, Auguste, was busy arranging the window display. He was driving me absolutely crazy with the way he was doing the window. I insisted that he step back and let me try to do it like it was a painting. It had all the powerful colors, the red of stuffed tongues, the yellow of jambon, um, blue paper shreds, pink where things had been cut into, gr into green from sprigs of heather, and most especially the black of boudin, a spectacular black that I have never been able to capture again. And then the call fat, fat, the sausages, the andouille, the bread, breaded pig's feet gave me subtle a subtle range of grays. So I made a virtual work of art. I took the platters and the dishes, canning jars and crocks. I carefully placed the colors in an astonishing still life, bursting with color, ingeniously running up and down the color scale. Hungry flames shot out of the red tongues and the Buddha mingled with the clear tones of sausages, hinting at a colossal bellyache. You see, I had painted the gluttony of Christmas Eve dinner, the midnight hour for overeating, the gorging of stomachs inspired by the singing of carols. So um, I thought that passage fitting to read, especially given the holidays. Uh, but you see, you know, how Emile Zola could not decouple the visual art from food. He saw them as this beautiful symbiotic relationship, a, a relationship that worked so perfectly together, um, food as art. Um, and Danielle Defidi, my friend, um, adds her amen to that. She says, um, uh, well, I asked her what uh, culinary art school was like, what it was like to attend culinary art school. And she said, for me, culinary school was a place where all the basics were learned. It was really a place where I learned the structure behind the art. In culinary school, I took classes such as soup, stocks, and sauces, cooking fundamentals, and meat cutting. These classes were designed to teach me everything every chef should know, such as the mother sauces, the difference between cooking with wet or dry heat, or how to break down a chicken. And, um, and that's what I love. I think she and Emile Zola showed how things that we might consider ordinary or even maybe low food like tongue, which by the way, if you have not had a lengua taco, a tongue taco, you have not lived. I'm just going to say that. Find a lengua taco <laughs> in your town and eat it and you'll understand what I'm saying. But she takes, you know, she and Emile Zola are saying, you know, these basics are art, the fundamentals. Um, and it's interesting because Zola was writing at a time that was not only revolutionary from a political sense in France, but it was also revolutionary from a visual art perspective. You have a rejection or um, a turning away from, um, you know, uh, a lot of the traditions of the art world and, and what was viewed as the restrictions, right? You have impressionism coming onto the scene, and abstract expressionism, and cubism. Um, but if you took an artist like a Picasso who spent a lot of time in France in the Paris area, while not originally French born, he um, was classically trained. And that's the kind of artist that Danielle is. And that is the kind of artist that many of the chefs that you will see may have had on, on a, a series like the Netflix series Chef's Table. They may have had a very basic traditional education um, and then they're able to, I think you need to learn those rules to break them beautifully, artistically and in your own way. That's my personal 
art take, I guess, um, as, as a, an amateur art historian. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is what is so lovely about the book, um, is, is the description of these seemingly sort of benign food items like cabbage, that he tends to bring up cabbage a lot in the book. I don't know if you'll notice, but that is something that becomes just gorgeous how he describes the purple color and the Savoy cabbage and the greens and how they kind of look like cannonballs. And I mean, just he's he's so into cabbage and into those those basic seeing the art and the sort of reductive, very basic, very art for art's sake, paint on canvas. Um, and that is uh, is beautiful. I I asked Danielle, when does just plain old food become art to her? And she said, I personally believe that food becomes art when the person cooking it really puts their soul into what they're doing. And anyone can flip a burger, but if you eat a burger from someone who really put their heart into it and cared about what they were doing, that burger could be a real work of art. I love that, you know, their heart and soul, and, and you can taste the difference. It reminds me going back to Picasso of a, a fairly famous story. Uh, Picasso was in a restaurant and he doodled on a napkin uh, while he was waiting for um, the other part of his party to attempt to come to the restaurant kind of through his meal. And a woman at a table near him noticed his drawings, liked the drawing on the napkin. He stood up at the end of the meal to walk out of the restaurant and was about to throw away the napkin. And she approached him and said, could I please have your napkin? And he turned to her and he said, well, that will be 20,000 francs. And she scoffed, I mean, shocked. And, and just said, I mean, you were gonna throw this away and that's a napkin. And, and that's, you know, I mean, what? And he said, you know, she, she said, this took you 20 minutes to draw. And he said, no, you know, it, it may have taken me 20 minutes to draw on this particular napkin, but the concepts behind cubism, the idea has taken me a lifetime. And, uh, and I just, I really love that, you know, he was someone who really did put his, his heart and soul, his whole effort, his creativity into his art after being very classically trained. Um, for those of you who, who have not seen early Picassos, they are beautiful. His realist work, his, um, early works are beautiful just as his cubist works are. Um, and I find it fascinating that he had the courage to break with tradition and to, learn the rules and then bend them and make them his own. So um, my next question was kind of out of personal curiosity because I have seen the series Chef's Table and I did see the episode um, about Dominique Crenn and I, I do encourage everyone to watch it that can. It's really a great, uh, great series and a great episode. I said that uh, Chef Dominique Crenn is widely recognized as one of the most avant-garde food artists of our day. She's kind of like the Picasso of today. Um, and I asked her, what was it like working for her and bringing her food creations to life in the kitchen? And she responded, Dominique is a really unique and incredible person. I really enjoyed working with her. She doesn't work in her kitchens every day. So when she was there, it was fun to see her in the kitchen. Cooking for Chef Crenn means you have to do it perfectly and exactly the way she wants it. When we first opened Petit Crenn and she was helping write the menu, it was always interesting to bring her a first test of a new dish she had asked for and see her think through it as she ate it and give suggestions on how to fix it to make it exactly right and mention exactly what she did or did not like about it. Um, and um, I just, I have so much envy for Danielle's experience. I know it is such hard work, but I think it would be fascinating and, and such a um, wonderful opportunity to get to work with some of these um, kind of cutting edge culinary artists. Uh, because it's the holiday season, um, I, I couldn't, uh, you know, leave off my conversation with Danielle. And I wouldn't want to leave off my conversation with you all without asking Danielle about the holidays and, um, and I asked her to share her favorite holiday dish with us, with our group. 
She said, uh, when it comes to holiday dishes, my favorite thing is nothing fancy or anything I learned in school or from any of the chefs I've worked under. It is my Nana's meat stuffing. Put simply, it's ground pork and beef and bread stuffing. It's the ultimate comfort food. And I just, um, as I wrap up tonight's club meeting, um, I hope that you all are able to have a wonderful season of food that is comforting. It is that time of year where family traditions and dishes that are generational get passed down. And there is something very beautiful about the experience of creating a dish that is historical for you, that is um, comforting to you, that is reminiscent of memories from Christmases or holidays past. And, um, and there's something special about passing those traditions on. On a personal note, I, uh, after having Thanksgiving with my family this last weekend, uh, um, it made me nostalgic. We had, you know, a lovely spread. My mom is um, an exquisite pie maker. Um, and she actually does consult on a, a local, in, in their town, a local culinary art program. Um, she's a fabulous cook. I'm so fortunate to be her daughter. Um, and, and my grandmother, uh, the holidays are special for us after Thanksgiving. Traditionally, the day after, all of the women in the family get together and cook Christmas pudding. And uh, it is my grandmother, my nanny, we call her nanny, um, her flaming pudding that we have each Christmas. We make this yummy traditional sort of shredded carrots and figgy pudding, just the classic sort of um, European or English um, pudding cake. And um, every Christmas on Christmas Eve, we would have this big New England feast of seafood typically. And then um, we dim the lights and Nanny brings in the flaming pudding as we, to this chorus of all of us singing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. And now bring us a flaming pudding is the chorus that she'll bring the pudding in on, on that particular part of the song. And she puts a round of foil on the top of the pudding and douses sugar cubes in um, uh, some lemon extract. So there's some alcohol in the lemon extract. Lights it on fire and it flames and she comes in and then the, the sugar caramelizes over the pudding and there's a, a lovely hard sauce that's creamy and lots of butter in that sauce. And then a lovely sort of softer syrupy sauce that goes along with it. And, um, and it is wonderful. There's nothing like Christmas tastes like my nanny's Christmas pudding. Um, and so I just hope that you all are able to have your traditions. And if you are open to it, I would love for you to feel um, safe, you know, sharing to the, you know, for the community, sharing your Christmas traditions and your recipes with us here. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the book this month. And uh, I look forward to discussing Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter next month at Christmas time. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. We'll talk to you next month. Bye.